We all know that we're awash in genetic information. The question is, what do we do with it? This morning, we heard from Dr. Joel Dudley of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, the Icon Institute, where he spoke to us about the Resilience Project and the work he's doing with big data. Joel, I really enjoyed your talk this morning. Thank Thanks. you for coming out. Yeah, thank Can you. you tell me a little bit more about the big data that you've done? Yeah, I think uh, when new technologies come along, whether it be uh, you know, various forms of genomic profiling, sequencing, you know, what they allow us to do is take a new look at the world around us, right? It's almost like uh, when we were first mapping out the Earth, we had explorers you know, deciding to go into uncharted territories and sort of map out by hand what does the Earth look like, right? But then we had satellites and now we have things like drones that can fly around the world with HD cameras and, and take a new look at the world around us. And I think that's a bit of what um, genomics and, and molecular profiling tools let us do is uh, to sample and see in higher resolution the world around us. And, but then also the key is taking sort of a data-driven approach, saying uh, uh, maybe our current knowledge is limited and these tools let us measure sort of broadly what is the picture, what is the state of the world, and almost how physics tries to you know, discern the fundamental properties of atoms by, by smashing them and collecting data and, and see, seeing what happens to sort of understand reality. We can do that a bit now in biology and that's new. We haven't been able to do that. That's an old idea in other fields, but in biology it's new, which was very hypothesis driven. Now we can be much more data driven and we can find unexpected connections in the data that are just sitting right under us, whether they be uh, new uses for existing drugs or whether they be disease subtypes that uh, we weren't aware of. Yeah. And you pointed out some data looking at geo data set, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which is uh, publicly available microarray data, mm -hmm. genome wide, mm -hmm. of over a million samples. Mm -hmm. Then you point out an example, right? Of, is it uh, irritable bowel disease? Sure, yeah, we point out an example of, uh, from work I had done previously, uh, looking at uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, anti epilepsy drug, uh, working for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We found examples of. Um, uh, antipsychotic drugs working for cancer, and I think you can take that same paradigm and translate it into some things we're doing here at Mount Sinai, uh, which I talked about with our type 2 diabetes uh, patient population. By looking at our patient population in the same sort of uh, data-driven way and looking at unexpected connections uh, between our patients based on data, we find that there might be actually multiple subpopulations of type 2 diabetes in our population, and that's important because then we can find the genetic factors that would serve as markers for those subtypes. So this was a lot of data that yeah. you had to compile together. Mm -hmm. You showed a, uh, basically a heat map that looks something like South America yeah. and another continent. But yeah. of course, this is data clustering uh -huh. and then the color indicated, so the, the density of the association. Uh -huh. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. But the underlying data sets were very deep, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so one thing we really believe firmly in is that uh, in order to uh, you know, truly understand the complexity of whether it be uh, biology, whether it be a, a patient, that really you need to combine multiple types of information. You need multiple scales of data. Uh, DNA is useful, but the, only up to a certain point. RNA is useful up to a certain point. Uh, microbiome. And individually, they're they are powerful in their own way, but combined, they're much more powerful. The idea is to paint the whole picture of what's happening in physiology. And what I talked about, of course, is uh, physiology and anatomy is multi-scale. Uh, but the, the great thing is, is that we now have the molecular tools to start actually sampling not only the DNA, uh, but now the RNA, the microbiome, epigenetics, and we can start putting these layers of information uh, together with informatics. And speaking of that, then you talked a little bit about the Resilience Project yeah. and basically looking for genetic heroes. These mm -hmm. are individuals who have a debilitating mutation. Mm -hmm. They really should have be very diseased, mm -hmm. but they're actually healthy mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about that? Sure, and I think this is very much in the same spirit of all the other projects, whether it be drug repurposing or looking at new patient populations, is that by taking a data-driven approach, can we sort of take a new look, a higher resolution look at everything we thought we knew and, and see if that's true? Or you know, can, we, can we question these assumptions that these, uh, these uh, mutations are going to be 100% penetrant? But more importantly, with the Resilience Project, uh, being enabled by now a technology that lets us um, you know, per, uh, sequence inexpensively and capture large populations, what we're looking for are these rare individuals that may, through a uh, uh, quirk of nature, have compensated for an extremely, uh, you know, what would be in another individual devastating disease. So again, the technology in this case is letting us shine the, white, the light very wide and look at, at, at those among us to see if we happen uh, to find a resilient individual and are they walking around with the next drug target. 
for a, a disease that uh, has no options today. And then you mentioned that there is a proof of principle paper that's being yep. readied. Yes. Yeah. So you know, can't, can't, can't talk, talk too about much it. about pre-published work. <laughs> and again, uh, you know, credit on that really goes to individuals like Rong Chen and uh, and Eric Schott and others at Mount Sinai. But um, so we've been able to look at uh, you know several hundred thousand uh, individuals under the lens of the resilience panel, and have found, in fact, uh, there are resilient individuals among us, and they're not as rare as as, as potentially as we thought. So I'll leave, you know, I can only say that. <laughs> well, I look forward to yeah. reading that paper. Yeah. Thank you again Thanks. for coming this morning. Yeah.